Welcome to Teaching with Office 365. Uh, this was a follow-up workshop from our Teaching with Technology Institute we held this summer and really a result of our migration of student email from Google Apps for Education previously into Microsoft Outlook. We started this journey several years ago and are making the process over time. So we're trying to raise some awareness on the behalf of the division of IT who manages our Office 365 so that everyone knows what tools are available and how it can impact your teaching. My name is Stephanie Richter. I'm the Assistant Director of the Faculty Development and Instructional Design Center here at Northern Illinois University. And I'd appreciate it if you took a moment, all of you who are here live, and introduce yourself in the text chat. So again, you can click the small icon with the double arrows to open the collaboration panel, and then click the conversation bubble in order to access the chat. Just type a brief message of uh, who you are and what you do at the university it would be great so that we all know who's here. And thank you, Peter, for leading us off, and Alicia and Isabel. It's always great to see so many familiar faces. And some who are new. Nellie, I don't know that I've been in a session with you before, so thank you for joining us. So for today, I'd like you to be able to do a couple things. Oh, you've been here. I'm sorry, Nellie. I didn't recognize your name. <laughs> so maybe I'm the forgetful one here. So today, you should be able to describe what Office 365 is as a collective. Uh, and how it benefits both you as a, a faculty member and your students. And then select some office tools that you might use to facilitate more collaboration and engagement with your students. I will warn you, um, I'm going to talk about a lot of different tools. So it's, uh, you're not going to walk away with a deep knowledge of any one of them, but hopefully enough that you are aware of the capabilities and interested to, uh, to learn more and, and explore so that you can begin using these with your students. And I'll share some information at the end for how you can learn more if you're interested. So first of all, what is Office 365? Essentially, Office 365 is a subscription that the university maintains. We are paying for Microsoft Office uh, in a different way, essentially on a, a per license and a campus-wide basis for all of the offices and computer labs here on campus. By switching to Office 365, that actually allows us to provide a free EDU subscription for Microsoft Office for all of our students as well. So instead of just having Office for, for staff, faculty and staff and in computer labs, now students can have access to Office as well through their um, their studies here at NIU. It's actually, it's an $80 savings for four years um, that the students would otherwise be paying on their own personal computers. So Office 365 has really two components. One, it enables every faculty, staff, and student to download full versions of Microsoft Office on personal devices. So as a faculty member now, uh, your license for Microsoft is covered as well on your computer at home, as well as the one that the university provided in the office. You and students can download Microsoft Office on up to five different personal machines, computers, laptops, desktops, as well as you can use the mobile apps on up to five different mobile devices as well, such as a smartphone or tablet. And then Microsoft also provides online cloud versions of the software as well. In fact, there are far more tools available online than what you can download. But for example, now everyone has access to fairly rich versions of Microsoft Word, PowerPoint, and Excel through the Office 365 um, site. I should point out, since I didn't put it on the slide, uh, the URL for NIU to get to Office 365 is 0365.niu.edu. I'll put that in the text chat too if you haven't been into it before. And it's the same place you log in to check your email now online. And you log in with your NIU accounts and credentials. So why Office 365? I, I'm going to actually start with the bottom because I think that was a big part of the decision. By switching to this license as opposed to our campus-wide license we had before, we actually save money overall, not just on the licensing, which I think is actually a little more expensive, 
but on the administrative overhead that was used to manage Office before, as well as to manage our email and to manage student accounts in Google Apps. So in the division of IT, they can operate much more efficiently overall because of everyone being in the same ecosystem and platform. However, that's a minor part of the benefits that we get from Office 365. Uh, research on employer uh, desires show that more than anything, employers want students to be proficient with these types of tools. It also allows us as an entire campus to be on a single platform. So it's easier to, for students to email faculty and faculty to email students. It's easier for students to find and email each other. And it means that everything, every single student has a copy of Office and has access to that. So you don't have to deal with as many different versions of files and students turning in Word documents or Google documents or open Office or text files or whatever else they went and found, pages on their, their Mac. Uh, everything will be more consistent because it's unified. And then Office 365, Microsoft uh, in general, one of the biggest advantages is really high level security options. So Office 365 is both FERPA and HIPAA compliant. So you are able to uh, actually, when necessary, transmit educational or health records, store those in, in Office uh, OneDrive, or send emails as uh, those policies allow because of this uh, security compliance. So I did say that one of the top skills required by uh, employers is use of Microsoft Office. You can see here it was the number two skill that was identified on actual uh, job postings. The Office suite in general was number two. And then PowerPoint and Word were specifically called out at number 11 and 13 as well. So second right after communication skills. <laughs> apparently is proficiency with Microsoft Office tools. So incorporating these in your, your teaching and in your classroom activities will help students be prepared for the job market and for having success in those fields. But we're here today, pardon me, <clears throat> we're here today to really focus on how those tools can impact your teaching. Uh, so we're going to look at several of these and I'll offer some suggestions and I'd love for you to join in and offer some ideas of your own for how you could use these for teaching. The first tool we're going to talk about is OneDrive. Uh, so Microsoft OneDrive is really the glue that holds together most of the rest of the Office 365 ecosystem. OneDrive provides you with one terabyte of storage for files in the cloud. A terabyte is, I mean, it's not a huge amount of space anymore, but it's certainly a very large amount of space for you to have access to. With your files in OneDrive, you can access those and edit them from anywhere, any computer, any mobile device. As long as you have access to an internet connection, you can access those files. And if those are standard Microsoft Office files, such as a Word document, a PowerPoint presentation, an Excel spreadsheet, you can not only access those, but actually edit them as well. And because they're shared in the cloud, you can share those with anyone here at NIU or without people outside of NIU to give them access to view those files and or to edit those. So instead of offering Instead of sending files back and forth to collaborate on a document, you can store that in OneDrive and everyone can edit it in a single uh, collection, a single space, a single file, so that there aren't competing versions and conflicting versions out there uh, surfacing via email. You can actually collaborate on those in real time as well, just like you would in a Google Doc if you've used that. So my first question for you, let me pop this up here is have you used OneDrive before? We've had access to it actually for a year as a university, over a year. So some of you may have seen it before or have used it outside of NIU. It's certainly we're not the only ones who have access to this tool. So you'll see the poll pop up from the bottom. If it's closed, you can click the, the small graph that's next to the hand icon to open the poll back up again. So I'm gonna show those now. You can continue responding.
And it looks like of those of you who responded, half of you have used it and half haven't. So at least for some of you, this is new. And if you have used it, please chime in in the text chat with anything that you particularly like about it or ways that you have used it so far. I'm going to stop the poll for right now. So to access OneDrive, you log in to Office 365, as I said, at o365.niu.edu. And then you're, you'll be presented with this full list of different products and tools that you have available. OneDrive is a bit far down the list, but uh, is easily recognized by the, I think it's kind of a happy fluffy cloud logo. When you click that, then you're taken into the OneDrive experience. <clears throat> with OneDrive, you can create new files directly on the web. Uh, you can create folders as well, so you can organize your, your files just like you would on your own computer. But not only can you create a new Word document or a new presentation, you can also add existing files that you have with drag and drop. So there's an upload button here at the top. You can always use that. But I personally like drag and drop. So I just drag them from here as in a Mac. So I drag it from Finder to the website and it uploaded that file into my OneDrive space. Really makes it very easy to take the files you have been working on, essentially create a backup of those or begin working on those in the cloud or collaboratively. You can also share files, as I said. So there are two ways from OneDrive that you can share. Um, and there are probably more, far more than two ways. These are the two ways that I'm showing you. When you share a file, as I said, you have several different options. You can allow someone to view the file, meaning that here's a document for you to read. Uh, you can allow them to edit the document or a presentation or a spreadsheet. And then there are more advanced features as well where you can give them design access so that they can change more elements of the, the file itself. Uh, when you share a file with edit privileges, then the recipient can edit that, as I said, in real time with you. So you can have make changes together and see them as they change. You can make changes in different parts of a document. So one person can work on the top and one person can work on the bottom. Uh, and then there's also a, a chat feature where you can talk with each other via text chat while you're working on the document. In, um, in either case, you can, as I said, also share this with people who are outside of the university. So if you're cooperating on a, a document with colleagues from another university or uh, from a, another institution entirely, you can do that all through NIU's OneDrive instance. And then you can edit those files, as I promised, because of the the cloud versions of Microsoft, PowerPoint, and Excel. So here, again, I have a PowerPoint that I'm going to open. And you have a choice of opening that in PowerPoint Online, which is the, the first option here, obviously. Or you can open that in PowerPoint directly. This actually does some really high-tech wizardry in the background. But it opens up the file that's on the cloud server in PowerPoint on your computer. That does mean you have to have PowerPoint installed on your computer. But when it opens it there, you can edit it in the full version of PowerPoint. And when you save it, it automatically saves it back up to OneDrive. Um, it, as I said, it's one of those tremendous high-tech wizardry things that uh, almost looks like magic <laughs> because it works so well. Uh, most of the time, I like to just work in PowerPoint online when I'm doing this. You don't get as many, or Word Online or Excel Online, you don't get as many features, but you get the most um, most common features, the ones that are needed the most frequently. And uh, it keeps you in the same ecosystem. So it's a little less resource intensive. But it's, again, an easy way to edit those documents on the go from a mobile device, wherever you happen to be. So that's a quick overview of OneDrive particularly for those of you who have used it before, how do you think you would use these features of OneDrive within your own teaching and with your students? Um, or how would you ask your students to use OneDrive themselves in their learning? I'll give a few minutes if you want to, a few moments at least, if you want to type something into the text chat, 
or if you would like to uh, turn on your microphone, feel free to do so and let us know how you would use this for teaching purposes. Yes, David and Isabel right out the gate with group projects, collaborative projects. I think that's obviously a very clear uh, use of this because students, when we ask them to do that, they have to do a lot of, of figuring out how to work together. And often that means meeting together. They may not be able to. Again, it requires emailing files back and forth. This is a great way for students to collaborate more effectively with one another. Uh, I Stacy group presentations absolutely again with because they can create a PowerPoint presentation here uh, they can all work on that together or a budget share a very very interesting project there Peter to share photos very very cool it'd be a great um, either primary storage where multiple people could all access those photos or as a backup storage as well similar to Melissa putting the students work there, having students put their work there so they don't disappear. You can't lose the flash drive or have that laptop break. You'll have a version of the files always up in OneDrive. Uh, one other feature I should point out, let me come back to a slide that has it on here. Here we go. Up at the top here is an option called Sync. OneDrive also has a separate client that you can install if you're on Windows 7. Uh, if you're on Windows 8 or 10, I don't believe you have to. Uh, that allows you to sync files onto your own computer from OneDrive. So uh, for me, this works like Dropbox does, where when I install Dropbox, if you've used it, um, you'll know that you can have an, actually a copy of the files on your computer, as well as the copy in OneDrive that always stays synchronized. So if you make a change online or at another computer, that change ends up in the file on your work computer while you are at home. Uh, and so the sync client for OneDrive does that same thing. So it would be a great way to help students maintain backups of files that they've worked on so that they can't lose them and they always have the most recent version. Great. Thanks for all of the, the ideas. The next tool we're going to talk about is OneNote. So OneNote, um, if you want a, a comparison, if you've ever used Evernote, OneNote and Evernote are very similar. So OneNote allows you to take notes with uh, freeform text similar to a Word document where you can just take notes, or you can take them in a very specific outline style format. Uh, those notes aren't just static text, however, you can add of files like photos or media so you can record video or audio and synchronize that into your notes and those notes then can be collaborative so you can either share ones you've taken with someone else or you can take them together so that everyone's contributing to the same um, notebook and then OneNote like many of these tools has a web client in Office 365 a mobile client so that you can take notes on the go and access them from your phone, and desktop applications so that you can run from a desktop or a laptop computer to take notes there as well. OneDrive, OneNote, sorry, not Access OneDrive, Access OneNote is here in the purple. We'll talk about Class Notebook as well and how it's similar and different to OneNote. When you open OneNote, you work within a notebook. That is the um, the sort of default, that's the metaphor, I would say, <laughs> actually is the best word. It's the metaphor that OneNote uses for how it organizes your, your notes. Within a notebook, then that is organized into sections, kind of like having different tabs in a binder or in a, a paper notebook. And then within those sections, you can have individual pages. So this is my Stephanie at Work notebook. It's a default notebook that um, OneNote provided, but I made use of. In my sections, I've created sections for different types of meetings and different committees that I'm on. And then within a section, I have multiple pages. So this is my departmental meeting section. This is my uh, page from September 1st when we met just a few weeks ago, and some of the notes that I took during that meeting. Instead of scribbling these on paper, 
um, I, I do them here. And since most of my meetings now send out electronic agendas, I actually copy and paste the agenda in and just work from my adding notes to it from there. You can have more than one notebook. So this is my at work notebook. I could actually create notebooks for different projects or different committees or, or different roles. If I was a student, I would probably create uh, separate notebooks for separate classes, just like I would carry separate notebooks for separate classes. That brings me to the class notebook. With class notebook, um, faculty create those essentially for students. You set it up so that every student then has a notebook for your class in OneNote. When you establish it, you set up what sections are in your notebook as well. So by default, you have a content library where you can send files essentially to students or you can post content to students there. Uh, there's a section for a collaboration space as well, where students can collaboratively take notes and they can all see and contribute to that growing repository of information. I have envisioned this, for example, of having students in class collaboratively taking notes during a, a lecture or during a, a lab procedure, something like that, where they can take those notes together and modify to correct one another or just keep adding and take turns with who's currently taking those notes. And then that also creates individual student notebooks that are private between the student and the faculty member. So the student can use that for a journal, for example, or for doing assignments. You could theoretically use a class notebook as uh, your entire assessment system. I haven't seen it done, so it may be a little messy. I'm not necessarily recommending it. But with this structure, you could certainly build out a structure to do that. And class notebooks, you can create them in Office 365, where you set up which course it's for, and you as the instructor, and then you add your students. However, if you create them within Blackboard instead, there's a, a tool in Blackboard to create a classroom notebook, and then all of the students will be added automatically to the OneNote notebook. So you don't have to actually add in all 30, 40, 80 students, however many you happen to have in your given course. So it adds more efficiency in how you set them up. So I don't know how many of you have used OneNote before, but how do you see that it could be useful? Or if you have used it uh, yourself personally or in a class? I'd love to hear about that now. Well, it looks like, oh, good. Uh, Isabel, how do you set this up from Blackboard? That is a great question. Uh, in Blackboard, if you're in a content area, let me pull it up so I can go through some of the steps. Hang on a second. I think I can do this for real. Hang on. Let me share a Blackboard course here. Let's try it this way. Let me try that again since I decided not to pull up my course properly. Hmm. Well, I thought I was going to be fancy and be able to show you this, but it's not coming up. So I will just describe it quickly for you. Um, so in, in Blackboard, the OneNote is under Tools, and you have to click More Tools. So when you open, if you go into a content area, like into Content or Information, then you would click the Tools drop-down menu, click More Tools at the very bottom, and go to One Class, OneNote Class Notebook in the expanded menu. Um, no, Isabel, you can't add files that are already in Blackboard to it, but you can um, from the desktop application, if you have it on your own computer, if you install it there, then you can um, drag and drop from there. So you're not going to be able to drag and drop, you know, essentially you're not going to take files from Blackboard and put them into OneNote, 
but you will be able to take them on your computer and fairly easily add them all into OneNote. And Cheryl, yes, I, uh, anything for groups where they have to work together to plan, although we'll, I'll show you um, a little more about the, the planning and some tools for that too. Uh, I think it's a great way for students to be able to essentially work together, work a little bit independently, but come back together when they need to. Uh, some, some really good benefits there. And like I mentioned before, I, I think there's a lot to be said for sharing notes that students have taken in class, whether students actually collaborate on the same page of notes or if they take notes individually and then compare them to see, um, because we know students miss things and we know that they get them incorrect. This would be a way to, um, for them to reconcile those essentially together. It would also be fantastic for um, students who have accommodations from the Disability Resource Center that require someone else to take notes for them. It, using a OneNote notebook, they could actually work on the same set of notes together uh, instead of trying to copy notes for someone else or um, share them after class. They could do that all collaboratively in real time. David, no, I I have several monitors set up and my and four different browser windows. So unfortunately, Collaborate didn't show my desktop, so I closed it again. My apologies. The the this is what the third tool I guess that we're going to talk about is Skype for Business. It's one of my favorite tools that we've gotten access to by switching to Outlook. So. Skype for Business is the enterprise version of the Skype that you may have already used and loved. Uh, as regular Skype does, you have text, audio, and video chat. Skype for Business actually offers quite a bit more than that, and we'll go into what some of those are. Uh, because Skype is tied into our NIU institution, uh, you can find people in Skype for Business at NIU directly based on NIU directory information. So you can find them by name and determine if it's the right person because they're in the right department. Uh, you don't have to exchange Skype e addresses. You just look them up like you would to send them an email. And then because this is tied into our overall Office 365 architecture, Skype for Business saves text conversations in Outlook as well. So every conversation gets archived and saved for accountability. So Alicia, this is the one that online um, is not one of the apps that's listed there. When you install Office on your local machine, then you have access to Skype. If you're using a Mac, I should point out Macs, they're still working on transitioning into Skype for Business. So for a Mac, the tool is Link. I typed the name there in the text chat, L-Y-N-C. Link is uh, very similar to Skype, it's the predecessor to Skype for business um, and works pretty much the same way. They're working on, it should be fairly close to uh, migrating Mike's, Macs to the full Skype for business architecture as well. But in the meantime, if you use Link on a Mac and Skype for business on the PC, then, um, <clears throat> excuse me, then everyone can talk to one another. You also can see here in the, the image, Skype for Business is available not only for computers, but also for tablets and phones with mobile clients. So I'm going to start up another quick poll. It'll be interesting to see how this one goes. How many of you have used Skype before? Not just Skype for Business, but Skype in general. Have you used Skype to uh, converse with colleagues, to uh, interview someone perhaps, either or be interviewed? or uh, use it to contact international contacts, family. There are all sorts of reasons why people use Skype um, traditionally. So it looks like, again, of those of you who responded, the overwhelming majority of you um, have used Skype before. And, and Flora, you said you've used it with your family? Absolutely, I, I've just started, um, FaceTiming now with my sister because her her daughter, my niece, is 10 months old. And so we FaceTime quite a bit. And I'm sure at some point we'll, we'll move on to Skyping because I like it better. <laughs> and 
I do think, Alicia, that there are times for all of these tools to be used differently. I like Collaborate Ultra for a lot of things as well. Uh, there are ways that I think it's easier, ways where I think it's a little less convenient than being visibly available in, in Skype. But there are um, lots of different reasons to use the various tools at different times. And Cheryl used Skype for dissertation defense. Very interesting, particularly for international students. Excellent. We've interviewed um, prospective graduate assistants using Skype because it's what they're familiar with. So instead of putting them into a new um, a new platform, a new tool, we use the one that they're comfortable with. So Skype, we've used it for a lot of reasons personally, but why would you use it for teaching? For one, because the Skype client uh, is one that just sits on your computer. You can sign in when you're available. It really increases your visibility and your availability to students. Uh, Any time that you are that you consider yourself available for a student contact, you could log into Skype for Business, and then other students, your students in your class, could see you're available and contact you that way. Uh, we've been using it here internally for messages back and forth between our staff and to some extent with other staff and other departments. Um, that again, that visibility of always being seen, uh, being seen as available when you are available, I think helps people feel more comfortable reaching out to you. It is a quick way to communicate. Students find, I'm, I'm over generalizing here, but students find tools like email to be fairly formal and stiff where hopping into a Skype, they can send a quick IM to ask a question or make a quick call to you. Uh, but it is an official institutional channel. So you don't need to use personal information such as your own personal Skype account or your cell phone in order to make those quick uh, connections. And then for many of our departments that are eliminating office phones, it is a great substitute because when you're available, then you could have a text conversation or turn on an audio or potentially video conversation as well. So here's a quick look at the Skype for Business uh, desktop client, what it looks like on a computer. And I'll go through some of the quick features that are available in regular Skype and some that are not that you might use for teaching. One of the most important uh, features of, of Skype, and certainly of Skype for Business, I think is the ability to control your own availability, your presence essentially, whether or not you're seen as available and seen online. And because, again, it rather than making it an intrusion where someone can contact you when you're not available or, or busy with something else, you can sign out entirely when you don't want to be contacted. Or when you are, you can choose to be seen as available with like this green check mark. Uh, do not disturb if you are in your office, but you just don't want anyone to contact you. You can stay logged in, but change that. And if you're away, if you've walked away from your computer, uh, or if you're engaged in an activity at your desk that's not using your computer, you'll be seen as away or busy um, so that no one will contact you. You can, within your contact list, organize everyone into groups. So if you had students from a particular course, those could be organized into a single contact group to make uh, contacting them and interacting with them easier. Within a call itself, you can of course use audio and video uh, and text chat like you would in the traditional Skype. But one of the things I really like about Skype for Business is without having a subscription or, or payment, which is um, required to get these features in traditional Skype, you can also share your screen, do an application share, and share files. You can present actually a PowerPoint just like this if you wanted to, to hold a meeting or to conduct a review session with a student if they had questions. You can also have group calls where you can add, as I think there's a, probably a practical limit far more before there's a technical limit in terms of adding people into a group call so that all of you can be on the same page. Uh, we recently here internally, uh, in January, we held a teaching effectiveness institute that was entirely online. And the entire time that the we were in the Collaborate Ultra session for the online workshop, we were also, our staff were in a group chat 
in just a text chat, but a group chat in Skype so we could handle logistics in the background. And it worked marvelously to be able to have those conversations in a large group as opposed to sending them one-on-one -on -one or waiting for an email to go through. It's much, much quicker. And then there are other features that I haven't talked about. With uh, a combination between Skype and uh, Outlook, you can actually, when you schedule a meeting, you can choose to have it be a Skype meeting. That means when the reminder pops up for this meeting, it also will pop up with a link to a Skype session where everyone will join in together. And if you set up a meeting that way, you can actually turn on a lobby. In a lobby setting, when people join the meeting, they're put into sort of a holding space, a lobby where then you can invite them in one at a time or in several at a time into the actual chat. So if you're holding office hours, for example, you could schedule that so it goes on all of the students' uh, calendars. And then if they wanted to join you, they could sit in the lobby and you could talk to them privately one-on-one -on -one so that you were uh, still maintaining that the integrity of the office hours space and not talking about a student in front of their classmates. And then Skype meetings can also be recorded, essentially like a web conferencing session like this. And that video then uh, resides in your OneDrive account so that you have access to that video file later. And then there are also two other ways that you can access it. I've talked a lot about the desktop application, but there are mobile applications for this as well. So you can just check in with a, a contact if you need something from a colleague and they happen to be in Skype, you can Skype them from your phone and contact them quickly and easily. Uh, if you miss a connection, by the way, I didn't point out if someone tries to message you and you are away or you just don't see it so you don't answer it, that actually gets sent to you then via email. Their message gets into an email chain. And then you can just email back and still have that connection so you're not losing content. And then there are actually, and this comes back to you since you were trying to do this in the, um, the online in OneDrive, there are limited capabilities there as well. So in the upper right, when you've logged into Office 365, there is a, a small icon in the upper right that is essentially your, your photo, your avatar, if you have one. And if you are in, say, Outlook, um, you can actually turn on IM so that you can be contacted via I, uh, instant messaging there in the um, Outlook, in the online system. I do find that it's still kind of rolling out. It's very new, that ability. Uh, so you don't see it in all of the systems in Office 365 when you're online. Um, it's not, for example, on the landing page. But when I go into my email, I do have the ability to sign in or sign out of IM and be available or not that way. When you do that, as I said, it's a, a very restricted experience, you don't get nearly as many features as you do in the Skype desktop or mobile applications. But it's a direction that Microsoft is heading to try to infuse more of that collaborative experience in um, throughout the product. So if you'd like to take a moment to throw some ideas into the, the text chat, personally, um, I think to me, the clearest way is just simply sort of an office hours or availability so that students can contact you quickly, quickly and easily. Uh, or the other way I see it being used is in meetings with your colleagues. So instead of all coming together on campus, particularly with faculty spread across the, the country on various projects, you can still meet effectively using something like this. But as Alicia said, it's not really a replacement for web conferencing. There are still times to use Collaborate or to use Adobe Connect instead of using Skype. I just love that we have so many different options to choose from. So if you have ideas, go ahead and place those in the text chat. I'm going to forge ahead. Uh, the next tool I want to talk about is Office 365 Groups. This is um, essentially a combination of most of the features we've talked about and a few we haven't, like I didn't bother talking about email or calendars. Uh, so with a group, you can actually incorporate a OneNote notebook, a Skype contact list, uh, shared files, and a shared calendar space along with a shared conversation space. So email sent within a group 
actually are stored in a, while they come to you in your own inbox, they also get stored into a separate inbox. So you can have that deeper conversation and essentially collect all of those, those group related materials in one digital space. But um, either way, what the group does do that's fabulous for shared files is it puts those into an external repository, essentially. If you use OneDrive and you share a file, that file is still tied to your personal OneDrive folder. Whereas if you have a group and you put that file in a group, then uh, that is no longer in your account. And if you left the university, the group would still have access to that. If it's a file in your own OneDrive folder, when you leave, those leave with you. So for that reason, doing long-term work with a department or with a, um, a committee, using a group is a much more reliable way to manage shared files. Uh, I'm not going to get into SharePoint, which is a very robust collaboration system built into Microsoft Office 365. It is available to everyone at NIU. So if you, have, <clears throat> if you haven't looked into SharePoint, I highly recommend it. Uh, groups, I find, are sort of a lighter version of that. They're much easier to manage and therefore much easier to get started with. The other tool that groups have access to is Planner. So Planner is a project management tool. And you can see here in the, the green box, it's brand new. Actually just came out probably uh, maybe three or four weeks ago for us here at NIU. And Planner is a light project management tool. So you can use it to track deadlines and timelines. So the poll right now is, have you ever used a project management system before? This might be, say, Microsoft Project or uh, Trello is essentially a, a project management software. Uh, if you've built a Gantt chart in a system that was probably in some way related to project management, um, it's not as common of a tool. So it looks like the majority of you have not. That's great. I think you'll find something like Planner to be uh, a the easiest way to get started into something like this. So Planner, as I said, is similar to Trello. If you haven't used Trello, we have a workshop coming up. Uh, Trello.com is the site that I'm referring to here. It's a, also a fabulous tool. With Office 365, every single O365 group has one planner board. So essentially, you can think of a board as a whiteboard space. And you start putting tasks on your board uh, which are, in my mind, a little like post-it notes. So you group those in what Planner calls buckets, all of these different tasks. And on the digital task, you can set a deadline. You can assign those to people so that they get reminders. You can add checklists and descriptions and media files and Word documents so that it becomes a repository for organizing your work and uh, staying on track. Here's what it looks like. This is a, a fake planner for a technology summit. This is, looks like a, uh, a, an event that's being planned. So you can see here each of these across the top to do content, analytics. These are buckets of tasks. Each white card here is a task. And then for each task, you can see this analyze gaps has an owner. Finalize the design agency has a deadline of May 19th. The circles here are showing um, how much progress has been made or that this is in progress. And the, um, the colored flags to the right are labels. So you can set up a color coding system for which ones are due or which ones are most important or which committee is handling something. And then you can also set a checklist of different tasks that need to be done. So it's not just a single task. This one's a, a collection of discrete steps that need to be handled. Uh, Cheryl, I think this could be great for dissertation students so that you would have all of the tasks you need to do organized, not to mention for a dissertation, a doctoral student, being able to not only organize your, your dissertation work, but potentially your other <laughs> life tasks as well. So everyone has an individual planner board for yourself personally. And then every group you create gets a planner board as well. 
you could organize all of these into buckets. And then I don't have a screenshot, but I want to point out this charts option also lets you see your tasks visually organized by the labels you've set, organized by deadlines, organized by uh, who owns, who's assigned to that task. So it's not only a, um, here it's a, a like I, said, I think of these as digital post-it notes, not only an organization tool, but also a visualization tool. Yeah, I highly recommend. It's easy to get started with and uh, really easy to experiment with. So because I think most of you probably haven't used a tool like this, I thought I would just throw out my ideas for how you could use it, such as uh, providing space for students when they're collaborating on a project. You can set up a planner for them in an Office 365 group, and then the entire group of students can set different tasks. They can assign who's responsible and stay on track. You can organize perhaps um, a, a lab in order to share policies, tasks, communication, and again, a, a timeline of responsibilities for a group, and then tie that into a planner. And then again, if you have a committee where you're planning an event or initiative, whether that's for you as a faculty member or working with students, I think an Office 365 group is a great way to do that. And when you create a group, then you can tie in that shared planner. So Melissa asks, do we set up a group for them? And if so, how? Yes, you absolutely can set up the group for them. They could set up a group themselves, actually. Uh, but either way, if you set it up, you can then invite the students to the group, or they can set it up and invite each other. Groups are a little bit difficult to find in Outlook because it's not its own tool. I found the best way to do it is to go to uh, people. So if I go back to my list of all of the tools here. If you go to the people box, this is where actually like your contact lists are managed as well as you'll find that Outlook Office is doing some analysis on who you contact the most to connect you with them. Uh, on that tab, you'll be able to see a list of groups and there's a plus to create a group. So in the left side panel under people, you would click create in order to create a group. Anyone can cre create a group here at NIU? So you can create one, you can create many. I believe the limit, I just looked it up, each individual can only create 250 groups. So keep that in mind in case you need more than 250, have someone else create it for you, I guess. Uh, it seems like a large, large quantity of groups for one person to make or use. Uh, hopefully no one is on 250 committees, so that would be a lot. So moving right along, uh, the next tool we're going to look at is video. Uh, video is not necessarily super exciting, but in Office 365, you have an embedded video sharing platform where you can yourself post videos. And then the nice thing about the Office 365 version, as opposed to putting it in YouTube, is you can restrict access to specific people here at NIU or open it up to anyone, but again, anyone at NIU. If you want a video to be public, the video tool in Office 365 is not going to accomplish that because it restricts you have to be able to log in with an NIU credential to view it. However, if that's what you're looking for, if you're looking for that closed protected platform to be able to share video, this one is a great option. Uh, it uses most of the popular video formats. Uh, I've listed a few there. There's a whole list of them online. And then the videos themselves are optimized for viewing on the web or for viewing on a mobile device. You could embed these in a Blackboard course actually using embed code and then students in Blackboard would have to still log in to Office 365 to view it. So they can't share that again outside of Blackboard and they, if you restrict it to just a certain group of students, they couldn't even share it with a, co a, a classmate who is in a different course but not in yours. So again, it's a great tool for protected uh, careful sharing. Uh, thank you all for the comments that are coming in. If you do need to leave early, thank you. Um, and there'll be a recording so you can see what you miss. So for Power, the next one's Power BI. This one is an amazing tool. Uh, BI stands for Business Intelligence. So Power BI is a free business intelligence tool available for you and your students to use. This essentially is a light analytics tool. Well, it's not a light analytics, it's a very powerful analytics tool. 
it doesn't do analysis like um, SPSS or, or SAS to do uh, statistical analysis, but it does do a great job of taking data and visualizing it so that you can draw conclusions and see, see trends or um, see how they relate. You can use this easily just by importing an Excel spreadsheet, or you can do uh, more advanced work by pulling in data from databases and cloud services. Uh, I personally have mostly used from um, Excel. It does, Alicia, as you point out, when you click on Power BI, you will need to click sign in. You sign in again with your NIU credentials. If it asks you, otherwise you just need to click sign in and it will take you to it. Um, you have an account, it just has, Power BI, I believe, was a separate standalone tool that they have incorporated into Office 365, so it has that extra layer. Uh, one of my favorite things about Power BI, though, is when you have these dashboards cr created with these great uh, graphics, they're, in, they're, they're interactive. So on this pie chart for this year's sales at the very top here, if I clicked on a segment of this in the live dashboard, the rest of the visualization would actually change to reflect that I'm only interested in this segment of the data. So it's a great tool for visualizing how those segments interact with one another and how maybe trends differ based on those segments. Again, it's not a research or analysis tool, but it is a great tool for gaining insight from visualizing your data. And then the last tool I want to talk about is Sway. Sway is an easy to use interactive presentation tool. So unlike, instead of creating a PowerPoint with static, um, static images essentially with slides that come one after another. Sway, you create a timeline, a storyline to tell your story. It focuses more on visuals than it does on in-depth text, although you can certainly add as much text as you want. And instead of focusing on design, you can't change things like font and color and, and background graphics with Sway. You choose a template and then it turns your storyline into the rich and engaging presentation that uh, you, you're hoping for. So for example, on the left here, this is what the Sway timeline looks like. And you can see it's a series of, of just panels of boxes. Uh, there's some text in a picture and a picture in text and some text without a picture. But then when it is um, actually published, when you go to preview it, it magically turns it into these really rich, visual, engaging uh, presentations. Sway is another one to go and take a look at if you'd like students to create a presentation that's designed more for self-paced delivery, um, like on a kiosk to slide through something informational, or as a video to watch. Sway is a great option to play with. Um, as I said, it's fairly new, so I haven't used it very extensively, but I was very impressed with what I saw. There is so much more we haven't had a chance to talk about. For example, uh, just a few weeks ago, this forms box popped up. I haven't tried it yet. I'd love to and, and be able to tell you more about it. Uh, or, or on Dell for tasks or so many things. And you'll find that Office 365 updates quite regularly. So you may get a notification when a new tool is available, or you may just see a new box pop up in your, your list of apps. So keep an eye out. I encourage you to continue exploring and playing with Office 365. There are so many great tools and they're adding more all the time. To learn more about them, because it's changing so quickly, the best place to go is Office Directly. They have a great site of help documentation at support.office.com. You can learn more about all of these tools and more. Power BI, for example, has help that's out there as well, just not in my graphic. Uh, so go there for short videos and as well as text information on how to complete tasks and how to work with these different tools. You can also learn more on lynda.com. So NIU, as a reminder, has a subscription to lynda.com. You can sign in at go.niu.edu slash lynda. And the Division of IT has collected a selection of really useful tutorials. I'll put the link to this page directly here in your text chat. Uh, these are all out on lynda.com, but Division of IT has sort of collected those together as being some of the most valuable ones. For all of these then, you can watch the part of the videos or all of the videos and learn more. We also have a workshop coming up. 
particularly, we've scheduled one on collaborating using Microsoft OneDrive on October 13th. You can look for information for that to come out soon. That one will be hands-on and not online. So you'll have to come on campus, but you'll actually practice together creating and sharing documents in OneDrive. The information for that will come out shortly with our October workshop schedule. So hopefully, if you're interested, you'll be able to sign up. We are also offering a workshop on OneNote. We're hoping in November. We don't have that one scheduled yet, but you can look for a workshop on OneNote in particular coming out soon. And then if there's significant interest in others, we haven't planned out uh, which others workshops will offer in particular yet, but we do plan to continue to promote the, the use of these tools in teaching because there's really so much that you can do with them. So if you're interested in something in particular, let us know and we'll, we'll take that into consideration and try to fit in time to offer more uh, workshops on this. So with that, I'm going to stop and ask for more questions. But if you have any after this, feel free to reach out to me, and I will do my best to answer them or pass them on to the Division of IT if I can't. Isabel, I see you have a question here already. Do you have to reload Office 365 each time a new tool appears? So a lot of the new tools are going to be um, like Planner. That is a web-only tool. So if you're asking about installing the software on your computer, no, you don't need to uh, reinstall the software. Uh, if there is any tie-in, for example, um, they're doing a lot more to tie Skype and Outlook together or to tie Skype actually into Microsoft Word and PowerPoint. So if you're collaborating on a document, you can Skype from that software with your collaborators. Those changes as they become available are actually released as updates to the existing software. So you don't need to reinstall, you just need to actually install the updates for Microsoft. But most of the tools, like Planner, um, are, are web only. If you have any other questions, feel free to bring those in. But otherwise, I'm going to 